So good morning, everyone. Like I will be talking today about scaling serverless F# -sharp with Azure Functions. So this, in a retrospect, might not have been the best title. Uh, the best title is probably the subtitle. So the theme of the talk will be uh, what happens when you grow functions and uh, what happens if you grow functions and you want to stay sane in the process. So I'm going to be speaking a bit about the small functions and then bigger things you might find and like how is it that you can have a sane workflow so that you don't get crazy uh, when things start to get bigger. So briefly, uh, hello everyone. My name is uh, Matthias Brandevender. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on the internet. I usually look like the little guy on the right. And uh, maybe a couple of things. Like one thing is like usually the two topics I uh, talk about, uh, one of them would be F-sharp and functional programming. And the other side would be machine learning, uh, everything related to forecasting. That's the type of thing which normally excites me. Uh, you probably picked for my accent that I'm French. Actually, I live in the US, in uh, San Francisco since a while. Uh, but since America started to be great again, I have been advertising my French side maybe a bit more. <laughs> and so this is, uh, this is probably what you need to know about me. So now, one question you might ask here is like, uh, I mentioned that the two things I care about is uh, F-sharp and machine learning. And the question would be like, why the hell is he talking about Azure Functions? And does this have, uh, how are the two things connected? And the answer would be like there is really no direct connection. Uh, the way I went there is like most of us have a, maybe a dirty habit on the weekends. Some people like to uh, carve, carve wood. Some people like to reenact wars, things like that. My dirty hobby on the weekends is I really like to write bots on Twitter bots. And so on the weekends, I started to do bots. And uh, this is how I came into Azure Functions and serverless. So this is completely disconnected from the machine learning side. And so as a result, I started to write my bots and I started uh, using this since October. And uh, this was fine. And I wrote more and more and more Azure functions. And uh, the reason I, I wrote more of it is because I found it very enjoyable. I really loved it. But as they grew, I also found that there was a lot of friction. Uh, it, was, uh, it started, uh, like with most technologies, it started very nicely. You do the demo, and then it starts to get bigger. And it doesn't quite work the way it was advertised. And so what I'm going to try to do today is like to show you, essentially answer the question, uh, is it possible to have functions which are bigger? And uh, how do you make that so that you don't get crazy in the process? Or is this even possible? So this is what I'm going to uh, try to do. I'm going to share with you some of the things I tried, some of the problems I encountered, and uh, how I tried to address them. Uh, in that frame, uh, the battle plan is going to be simple. I'm going to start uh, with the part where functions shine. That will be functions in the small, so for small scripts, like you start with this and everything is beautiful. And then I'm going to start talking about places where it's not that great and uh, how you can start to uh, build back up to something which is nice. So we're going to first uh, move from the portal to a common line because common line is uh, awesome. Uh, then we're going to see that uh, if you do the command line, like lots of things are great, but some of the things are not quite great, and so we're going to see how to unbreak that thing. I'm going to talk a bit about pre-compiled functions, which is another way to uh, move into uh, something which works better. And then I'm going to talk at the end on uh, what do you do when you have not one function, but say 10, 20, and how do, how do you know that this thing works? I don't, I don't have a perfect solution to that, but I have uh, hints or uh, bits which might help. So let's start with uh, the functions in the small. And uh, to uh, give you a sense maybe for why I got excited about it, I thought I, I should start by uh, showing you functions uh, in the base scenario and why it's awesome or what's uh, beautiful about it and what got me excited. So uh, this is a very buzzword heavy topic. Uh, that uh, definition is not up on the website anymore, but a couple of months ago, if you went to the Azure Function website, you would find something which uh, was uh, this definition. It's a serverless, event-driven, blah, 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 Azure app, blah, blah, service platform, blah, nano service, blah, blah, scale based on demand, blah, blah, blah. So this is like uh, in two sentences, you probably have the highest possible density of buzzwords. And if you read this, it's like it's very unclear what does this mean? What is a nano service? What is this? What is that? And so the, uh, if you take away the buzzwords and you go to the non-buzzword uh, version, uh, Azure functions are pretty simple. Uh, it's really a couple of things. Like the first thing is like a function is two parts. One part is code. So this is going to be a script, a stateless script. And uh, the, uh, what the function does is like uh, when it is triggered, it runs the code and then it uh, goes to sleep. And uh, so that's uh, the first half. And the second half is like what is triggering the function, and so that would be an event. And so really the way it works is that you define on one side the event, the trigger, and whenever the trigger happens, it will fire your code, and then it forgets, and so on and so forth. So that's pretty simple. 
uh, on the Azure side, uh, the, uh, there is a notion of a function app. So a function app is a group of functions. So you can have like not only one function alone, but a couple of uh, functions which are together in an app. Uh, it is serverless, so I put it in a, a quotation marks because, like, uh, uh, of course, like serverless is not serverless, and somewhere somebody is running a server. Uh, the, uh, so the, uh, uh, the reason this might be a sensible uh, way to call it is because it's serverless in the sense that like, you don't care. The server is there for you. You don't have to deal with provisioning. You don't have to deal with uh, maintaining anything like the IT part. The server is there, but you don't have to worry about it. So that's uh, how I read serverless. The second side of serverless is like uh, not only do you have a server, but uh, that server or that service is going to handle also for you things like scaling. Like uh, if, you have a, if you have a trigger, like maybe you have many, many triggers happening. And so uh, if you did it uh, yourself on your own server, you would have to deal with scaling up and scaling down. That's actually coming out of the box for you. So that's another thing you don't need to deal with. And that's pretty convenient. Another thing which is useful to know about serverless is, uh, is uh, the uh, pricing model. So if you have uh, your own server uh, in your basement, like uh, in your farm, whatever, like uh, you're paying for the server 24-7. If you buy a VM, uh, if it runs, if it doesn't run, it doesn't really matter. You're going to pay for the whole time the thing is on. So in lots of cases, this is great because things are running all the time. But there are lots of cases where your code is going to run only occasionally. And if it does, like it's kind of a sad to have to pay. Like uh, If your code is running, say, every week you do a tiny batch process, it's a bit silly to pay for a machine which is going to be uh, uh, running very little, and you pay for the whole month. So uh, in the Azure Functions model, uh, you pay only for what you use. What this means is that you pay only when your code is running and you pay based on how long it runs and how much memory you're consuming, which is pretty nice. And it's also, if you have been doing things like Azure Web Jobs before, it's kind of a repackaged version of Azure Web Jobs. It's just much nicer to use, but it's uh, based on the same ideas. So uh, now that I talked a bit about uh, what a function is, is like let's actually write a function. And so I thought, uh, I thought the best way to do that would be to show you the experience live. So I'm going to do that. And uh, the example I'm going to take is a very important example. So we are in uh, Norway. And Norway is one of the countries where you learn very quickly that a beer is not uh, a cheap uh, thing to buy. And so coming from the US, I'm a bit concerned maybe that uh, the, how, how much will I pay for my beer? And so I would like to be updated on a regular basis on the exchange rate between the uh, Kron and the US dollar. So what I'm going to try to build is I'm going to build a function which every five seconds is going to send me a ping on Slack because of course I'm on Slack all the time. And uh, that way I will know when is a good time to pay beers for everybody and when I should just shut up and wait for somebody else to pay for the beers. So uh, the first thing, if you want to build that, is like uh, you would, uh, it's an Azure function, so you would uh, need to be an Azure, so we need a subscription. You would go to the portal and you would, uh, you would hit plus and you would uh, start to create an app, give it a name, you have a subscription, uh, all of these things, you say where it runs, so that's uh, pretty standard. One thing to note maybe is uh, every function is going to come also with a storage account. Uh, that's by default. The reason it's there is because also out of the box you get things like logs, like uh, monitoring, and so that has to go somewhere, and so the, uh, the storage account will be there for you created as, as you create the function app. So now I do that, I hit create, and at that point is I will have something in the portal which looks along these lines, so I would have like a function which is running, and now I can, or a function app which is ready to uh, run, and now I can start writing some code. And so this is what we will do. And uh, the, uh, so what I will do is along these lines. So let me go. And before going to the portal, I'm actually going to go to a VS Code. And uh, so the way I write typically F-sharp code is uh, I, I like F-sharp a lot because uh, it's a very uh, script-friendly language. So when I write F-sharp code, I go to a VS Code and I start to hack a, hack a bit of a code to see like, what is it that I'm trying to do. And uh, in essence, like, uh, my, uh, what I'm trying to build here has two parts. One part is like I need to grab some exchange rate from the internet. And, so, and the second part is I will need to post to Slack. So the first part about the exchange rate, uh, I dug a bit. I'm a cheap person, so I wanted a free service. And uh, I found out that Yahoo, first, that like, Yahoo is still uh, alive. So <laughs> last I checked. And the second part is uh, Yahoo as a service, which is free. And you can uh, ask things like, what is the exchange rate now between two, uh, between two currencies? So I'm going to just run that script. So I would do something like this. Like, let's take that. I'm going to uh, system.net. Then I'm going to hack it like a pig. So I'm going to put like a URL. That's a URL to the service on Yahoo. And uh, if I take that URL, 
I create a web client. And now it's like, uh, because I'm uh, not very subtle and, and I'm a hack mode, I'm not going to do anything subtle. I'm going to say, take this, take that URL, grab this down as a string, and show me the result. And so the result is going to be something which is not particularly sexy. But what it is is like it's a big, fat XML document where I see what I'm getting is the GBP. Actually, it's GBP, so I made a mistake here. But a GBP to a dollars, and you have the current rate at what time it was done, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of done. Is like if I call that URL, I will get the latest uh, exchange rate. The second part of the problem is uh, I need to, uh, to post to Slack. That's also not very difficult. The way we do it is like grab uh, .NET HTTP, uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to grab my dependencies here. Again, I'm going to go a bit old school, so I'm going to create an HTTP client. And here, I pre-provisioned, so I have my own Slack, uh, because I like to talk to myself, and, uh, and also because I like to experiment with the bots. So I have this, I provisioned like a webhook. So now the only thing I, I need to do here is uh, simply take this, so take the URL to my, uh, to my hook, and I will, uh, I'm a hipster for San Francisco, so I'm going to do like a good old-fashioned hand-carved message here, which is going to be uh, text, hello in DC, so let's create the JSON message by hand, and I'm going to post it. And if I do that, what I should see now in my Slack channel is something which is saying hello in DC. So my script works, everything is fine, and now my problem at that point is uh, how do I, this is nice, but this is running on my local machine, I would like to make it run in the cloud somewhere so that it's actually an application. So let's do that. So if I want to do that, I could, uh, I'm going to take it, I have two parts in my code. One of them is like grabbing the rate, the other one is posting to Slack. So I'm going to start with the uh, second part, which is posting to Slack. I mentioned that we have triggers, or we have things which are going to trigger uh, the, uh, I'm going to, so essentially I'm going to separate this into two separate functions to do these two pieces of functionality, and then I'm going to uh, hook them together. So let's go to the portal. And in the portal here, I already created like uh, something which is called function demos, which is where I write my function demos. And I'm going to add a function right now. And I'm going to uh, call this. So here you can pick uh, many things. You can pick the language you want to write your code in. So if you like batch, go ahead, knock yourself out. If you want JavaScript, of course you can do this. PHP, like uh, I'm sure some people want to write PHP. So this is not what I want. I'm going to pick C sharp is there, but I want F sharp. So I'm going to pick F sharp. And out of the box, you have a bunch of uh, triggers or scenarios which are supported. So I'm going to pick one. So you have triggers which are timer, HTTP, all of these. The one I'm going to pick right now is a queue trigger. So if I pick a queue trigger, uh, this is something which is going to be triggered when a message comes in the queue. I'm going to give it a name. So let's call it like uh, NDC 2017. And uh, if I tell it like I want to trigger on a queue, I probably need to have a queue. So I'm going to give it a name, NDC demo. And the storage account connection, why is it not happy? Of course, this is the moment where everything worked before and now it's not working. Why is this not showing me? So this is like one of the, uh, uh, okay, that's fine. That's fine. So this is actually good. So this is a, a, a that's already a heads up on the pieces I don't quite like. Is like I'm, a, I'm, I'm a online and things are like, I don't want to work that way. I'm at the mercy of the internet. And so that's one of the parts which I don't really like about this. But uh, let's forget that part. So now is like I create my function. So what I said is like a, a function is triggered by a queue. Uh, it's, uh, I give it, uh, I give the queue a name and that's all I had to do. And now it's like, uh, immediately what I get here is something which looks like this. So I get a function which is called run, which is expecting two things, like an input message, which is going to be what is it that I'm pulling from the queue and a trace writer, which is, uh, which is allowing me to uh, log. And so what I can do immediately, uh, I can do things like this. I can go here and I can say, let's test if this function works. So I'm going to do something like, uh, does this work? I'm going to send it to the queue, and it's going to go to the queue, and now is that like you can see that uh, the logs are actually being triggered, and uh, if I look here on the logs, it's telling me, hey, uh, queue trigger has been processed, and it took the message, does this work? Uh, and uh, it's, it's showing me like what it pulled from the queue. So uh, this is pretty nice, like I get like immediately code, the code immediately runs, I can test it, and uh, this is, uh, this is uh, making me happy. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is uh, also not completely magic, like you can actually look behind the scenes. And so what happened here is like it created a folder. That folder is called NDC 2017, which is the name I gave to the function. 
And uh, the name I gave to the function, two things came out of this. One of them is run.fsx. This is the file I'm looking at right now, which is a straight standard uh, F-sharp script. And the second part is uh, the trigger. And so the trigger here, I defined it through the portal. This was nice, but in the end, what it is, it's a JSON file. And the JSON file co contains a description of what the function is about. So here I have bindings, and uh, the binding I have is a queue trigger, which is what I defined. Uh, it, it expects a parameter which is going to be an input message. This is uh, how it connects to this file here. Uh, input message is uh, uh, the parameter is defined in my JSON file. And, uh, uh, and here, so it's in because it's uh, coming in the function and triggering it. And here is the name of the queue I wanted to use. And so the good news is that if, uh, if I want to work with this, I can work through the UI or I can edit the JSON file directly. That would be completely equivalent. So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is, in a sense, a function. The, so let me go back to uh, this for a second. So we saw that there was a log. So the log is actually uh, coming from what I did here. Let's say I'm going to break that code for a second. I'm going to do something like foo bar, which is not valid f -sharp code, and I'm going to save it. And if I save this, what I'm going to see is that it's going, my code changed. So what I see now is like uh, detected, aha, the code changed, trying to recompile it, and it's telling me that the compilation failed, and it's even telling me normally where it broke, that's in like 2.5, foo bar, blah, 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 doesn't exist. So you get also, so the, uh, the default, uh, if I take my uh, hack mode on, it's kind of nice, I can write code, save it, if it works, I'm happy, if it doesn't work, I get a decent error message, and I can, uh, keep, uh, I can keep going that way. So uh, this is not, uh, logging is nice, but this is not really what I want. What I want is I want to take the code I had before, and that code was uh, grab this and post this to Slack. So let's do this. And uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to, I'm going to take the code I had right before here. And so if I want to make this work, it's like it's really not going to be very difficult. It's like the two things I need is I'm going to take that part. I'm going to copy paste it because this is how we all write code. It's a true and tested uh, design pattern. So let's do that. And uh, the second part is like I don't want to log. I want to actually write to Slack. So let's do that as well. So I'm going to go back to uh, my code here and I'm going to take all of this. And I'm going to also paste this uh, into here. I'm going to indent a bit. And so, uh, and so he really, like the thing which is nice here is that I just took a script which worked. I copy pasted it, and uh, the, uh, I would be happy if I saved it and it compiled. And so, if uh, if the gods are with me, uh, it's going to tell me that the compilation succeeded. And so now, if I did something, if I go back to test, and uh, this does this still work? Actually, this is not going to take this because right now the message I'm sending is actually only. Uh, I'm still hard coding like hello in DC, so like I still need to change something. So first, like let's test this, and if I do this, I should see again a message coming to my Slack, and that's, uh, that message should still be hello in DC. And here we go. So now is like uh, I connected that script, but it's running in the cloud. I'm happy. Everything is moving on. So last change I need to do here, I need to say I don't want to write hello in DC. I really want to uh, pull in uh, the uh, the message I got from the queue. So I'm going to say uh, let a message or let content equals, and I'm going to do it again like a bit old school. I'm going to take this. Let's do that. And here, instead of hello in DC, I'm simply going to shove in uh, the content of the input message. And now I should be able to do content here. And so if, uh, if everything is going fine, if I save, it will build. And if it builds, at that point, what I should get is something which is actually going to come from the queue. So I'm going to, does it still work? Now, let's test this. And now I'm hoping to see, does this still work, popping up in my Slack channel in a second. And sure enough, it works. So uh, success. I am massively happy. Now I have my script, which is running in the cloud serverless. Uh, I'm buzzword compliant. This is awesome. So the, uh, the second part of the problem is like uh, now the second part we want is uh, we have a, uh, another piece of the script and that script is supposed to call Yahoo, grab a string or grab a, an XML file 
uh, and I would ideally want to extract the rate and all of this. So this is not very complicated. I'm not going to do it entirely by hand. I wrote that piece before, uh, and I will just show it to you and show you a couple of the other features you have, because usually when I write this live, it's like something goes wrong in the middle of it. So I figured uh, you look like, a, uh, I think I look like a trustworthy person. So it's like, uh, I hope that uh, you will trust me that uh, I wrote it by hand and that this would work. But let's, whoops, let's go here. And so the uh, function I already wrote is the one which is uh, here, which is NDC retrieve read. And so that function, I went a bit further than the script I showed you before, uh, but in a sense, so a couple of things. Like that function, uh, at that point, I want something which pings the internet every five seconds and does something. So you have a trigger for that, and that trigger is called the timer. And so if I look at the way this function is uh, structured, uh, I would go to function.json because this is where I see how my function works or like uh, how it's triggered and all this. And here I see two pieces. One piece is a binding here, which is a timer trigger. And so a timer trigger is going to be based on time. And uh, here you have something which looks like a cron specification or cron job or however you call this. And this is saying like every 10 seconds, I'm going to call the internet. I'm actually going to call it every five seconds because why not? Uh, and I give it a name, so that's a timer, this is fine. And I have another piece here uh, so I, I'm not restricted to just one binding. You can add as many as you want. Every function needs a trigger because something needs to call the function. But besides that, you can also call other things. You can maybe want to uh, read something from a file, or you, you might want to write something to another resource. And so this is where you have the direction. Things can be in or out. And here I have another binding, which is an out binding, which is going to a queue. That queue, uh, I will call the content of this thing a message, and it will go to the NDC queue, which is uh, the one I created before. So my hope here, so it's a string based, and so here this is saying I will find a queue called NDC queue, and every five seconds I will do something, and I will probably write something to that queue, and so the hope is the other one will pick up from the same queue, and then write to Slack. Cool, so that's the, uh, that's the uh, binding spot. Uh, the other thing, so now let's look a bit at the code here. Yes? Uh, this is what I'm hoping. If it's not, uh, the two will not be connected, so we will see in a second. Yeah, that's right. It's like there are two parts. So that's a good comment here. Uh, there are two parts here. It's like one of them is like, how did I call the queue? And the other one is like, uh, where is that queue living? Like uh, the queue is not completely magic, like it in the storage account. So I define also in which storage account should you be finding this queue. Actually, let me make that work immediately just to make sure that Scott's comment is not going to bite me a bit later. I'm going to check, and this is not the right storage account, so I'm going to put this on the right storage account, and I'm going to save this. This is a good point. Thank you, Scott. You saved me from uh, shooting myself in the foot. Uh, NDCQ, see? We are now doing like pair programming, <laughs> saving myself from, uh, from disaster, so that's done. And now, like, uh, yeah, thank you, so that's it. So now is, uh, this is one of the issues as well. So this is string-based, so it's like uh, nothing would prevent me from writing queues, and uh, they might not talk to each other. So that's one place, which is a problem I'm going to hint at later, is like if you start to have like many, many, many queues with many names, at some point you might lose track a bit of uh, what is talking to what. So anyways, so this one is ready to go. Uh, the, now I'm going to go back to the uh, retrieve rate function, which was here. And so uh, the, I, what I still have is I still have a function which is run, which is now taking a timer. And I also have a parameter message that's from the binding. So this is the message which is supposed to go out to the queue. And it's a byref message. I'm going to show you how to use that. And what the function does is like pretty much what I did before. I'm grabbing the URL from Yahoo. And then I'm creating, uh, I'm uh, doing a couple of things here. And at the end, what I'm going to say is like the message, shove into it a string, push that into the queue, and this is all I have to do. So the, the couple of extra things I did here is because I'm using F sharp is like uh, I could pass the XML file by hand. This is not going to be very fun. So maybe I want to use something like an external library, like a type provider. And uh, the good news is that you don't have to write all the code by hand. It's like people who did functions are not completely crazy. They know that you might want to use libraries. And so the way you do that is uh, here, besides the function JSON file, I have a, project, a file called project JSON. And in project JSON, I don't think I need to explain much what this does. This is saying like this function uh, is expecting .NET 4.6, and it takes a dependency on F# -sharp data, which is the name of the NuGet package, and this is the version I'm going to be using. And if I do this, I save this, it's going to uh, trigger uh, NuGet restore, blah, 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 and at that point, I should be able to use that library. So the good news here is that you can use whatever you want. If it's on NuGet, uh, you're happy. 
Uh, if it's not a NuGet, you can also do that. I'm not going to talk about it right now, but you can also upload the DLL. You can do whatever you want, so you can consume anything you want. So now is like uh, I have this library available, so I should be able to use it here, which is what I'm doing. So here I'm saying open F# -sharp data, like using F# -sharp data. It's here, and I'm fine. And the uh, the other part is like normally when uh, you use a type provider, usually you're going to provide a sample to work from it. For instance, what I might want to do is like I might want to give it a sample of XML, which is representative of the message I'm going to be consuming. And so this is what I did here. I created a sample file. This is exactly how the message is supposed to look like. Now the type provider will use this to create, uh, to extract out the data from what I'm getting from Yahoo. So that's not particularly interesting. The reason I wanted to show this is because now what I did is that I created a file. I can create many FSX files. I could add files to this folder, and I'm able to consume them directly from the script like this. And so here, like this is exactly what I would do locally on my machine. I'm going to say like, hey, in the source directory, which is where my file is right now, you're going to file call a file, you, you are going to find a file called sample.xml. So it's pretty free form. Like the experience I get here is like extremely close to what I have uh, if I'm working on my local machine. And so now uh, if I do this, so the hope, if I didn't break anything is like, uh, I'm going to run this by hand. So I didn't change anything. So let's run this. And if I run this, I see that my function started. And uh, what I'm getting here is like a rate. It's telling me that right now my beer is uh, something times 0 0.117. Uh, so I got my rate straight from, the, uh, from uh, Yahoo. And if I run it again with a bit of chance, the rate will be different. And you will see that I'm not full of it. And yes, the rate changed. So I'm actually doing live calls right now from the internet and getting the rates. So this is great. And uh, if everything actually works fine, uh, the, so actually let me put it completely on. Right now, my function is disabled, but I can go to manage and I can put it back on. So you have this ability to, like you can take offline, online a function at any time. So now I'm going to put it back on, enable it. And so if I go here, the cron job says this should run every five seconds. So what I should see first is like my log should start to become much more active. And I'm, uh, I'm hoping to see like a call being made every five seconds. And if everything is going fine, I should also start to see uh, a bunch of, so these are the two calls already made. So this is proving the point right now here on Slack. Uh, what I'm seeing here is like two messages came in to my Slack channel. And so these were the two I, uh, I created by hand. So what this is saying is like the, now like the first function, and you see that, so this is the most unexciting uh, Slack bot you could probably get. But uh, now I, I, uh, this is working, right? Because now I'm seeing a message pop up every five seconds on Slack. The only reason this is uh, happening is because the, the first function we wrote is writing to Slack, and the only way it could work is if the first function is actually activated every five seconds, pulling things and sending it to the other one. So we have like now a fully connected application, which is uh, completely polluting my Slack. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it off. Let's do that. I'm going to go back to manage, and I'm going to say disable this, because this is annoying. Good. So let me recap a bit, and let's see what we did. So yes, I talked about like so. I talked about that part. I talked about creating the queue. I showed you how if you save it and break it, yeah, you can look at the logs as well. I'm not going to look at that. I did that. I showed you how. You, yeah. So recap is like uh, the the piece I really like about this. Uh, so first, it works. So I'm I'm happy because oftentimes you do a live demo depending on the internet, and like uh, many things can go wrong. So nothing went wrong. So I'm uh, this is a success. So uh, the, uh, the recap here, I hope this gives you a bit of a sense first of how a function might work and what might be nice about it. So a function app was one or more functions. We did an app with two functions talking to each other. We had code, which was a script. We just dropped the script pretty much the way I would write it locally. We defined the event, and it worked. Uh, script uh, in whatever you want, uh, for uh, obvious reasons, being an f -sharp fanatic, uh, I would write my scripts in f -sharp, But like, if you want to do the same thing uh, in Bash, you can do that. The binding, the event is going to be defined in the JSON file. Like you can do it through the portal, but you can edit equally well uh, the JSON file, which we did, actually. You can use NuGet uh, to uh, grab your dependencies. And uh, you can use external storage and all this stuff. So why uh, did I find this nice? Like for me, this was nice for two reasons. Uh, uh, so one of the things I really enjoy about scripting and scripting in F-Sharp is that I can start fleshing out very rapidly how my domain and how my code should be looking like, and nothing beats a script. Hack a bit, see if it works, change it, see if it works, ship it. Uh, the problem is that like, shipping a script in production is not very easy. 
functions give me exactly that. They give me the ability to take that script and pretty much drop it in, in production, and I have an, uh, uh, an app which is running. The other piece which is nice is that like, uh, if you write an application, is like you think maybe I want a queue, maybe I want storage, I want all of these things. And uh, it's not that difficult to provision a queue, but it's a bit of a hassle. Like uh, I, need to, uh, I need to make sure the queue is there, I need to maybe install it, all these things. Like with the function, the only thing I need to do is I need to say in the binding, I'm going to be using a queue, this queue should be called foo, and it will create it for me and I can just start using it. So this is awesome because I can write tiny bits of code and I can just sketch out my architecture in a way which is uh, as flexible as I can uh, sketch out my code in the script. So this is, uh, this is what's for me very liberating because uh, I could start uh, I could start flashing like entire application just like that. Like uh, uh, this is a, so this is pretty nice. The uh, the other thing which is nice is like uh, I didn't have to worry about the queues and all that stuff. I didn't have to worry about the plumbing. So all I'm doing now is I'm focusing on delivering value and writing code. Like all the annoying details about the server are gone. So that's great. If I want to queue, I have it. If I want to deploy, I have it. So all of that is taken care of. So uh, as a result, is like I started to use functions a bit, a bit more, a bit more, a bit more, and I started to have a lot of functions. The other benefit is money. Uh, so like I'm doing, I'm doing bots, and bots are great, but like uh, my Twitter bots are not very active. Like typically, on a successful month, I'm getting 20 tweets. Uh, I used to run them on a VM. Like that VM used to cost me like $12 a month. It's not hugely expensive, but it's close to $1 a tweet. Uh, it's uh, not cheap either, so I like people using my bots, but it's still maybe a bit uh, more expensive that I'm willing to spend for people. So here, uh, what I'm getting with an Azure function is that by default you get like one million requests per month for free. So uh, for a bot, is like essentially uh, my bill went from uh, 12 bucks to zero. And this is going, essentially you're going to pay uh, of the order of like cents per million's execution. So this is, uh, this is also a very uh, positive uh, aspect of functions. So, so far, you might say, like, this is great, like, uh, uh, functions look like the way to go. Is like, what is it that could uh, not be great about it? Like, uh, why is it that you're giving this talk? Like, right now, you could just go rewrite your whole applications in functions. It's going to be cheap. It's going to be great. And it's not all great. Because, uh, uh, so, all I did right now is, like, uh, I like to hack. It's fun. But really what I did is like what I'm doing is I'm writing on a serverless server. I'm hacking like live code, shipping it like with zero verification. Like this is not awesome. Like uh, making life changes on a server is uh, still not an awesome habit. And if you keep going that way, like many, many things will uh, start to go wrong. And I, I probably don't need to spell it out because it's kind of obvious. But like first is like the development environment is not great. Like uh, it's good for an online environment. But uh, we are in 2017, like you have editors, you have things like that, you are expecting things maybe like IntelliSense, and I don't get that online, so that's a bit frustrating. The second one is like, okay, I can change my code, see that it's broken, but uh, I don't really have a good way, like right now my testing strategy is like write code, ship it, if it's uh, crashing, change it. It works. But uh, it would be nice to be able to know that my code is broken before I ship it in production. So I don't get that with the environment either. Source control, where is it? Like uh, teamwork is like, what will happen if I have 20 people starting to work on this online editor? Uh, like, uh, how am I going to share code maybe be between multiple functions? So many, many things are not going to go well. And if you keep going that way and grow bigger functions, uh, things, yeah, things are going to turn out a bit ugly. So this is a kind of the point I hit. Uh, I got into the point where, uh, the, uh, where uh, I had more functions, I had bigger functions, and the things were starting to become painful. So, uh, so what I want now is like I want something else, and what I would really want is, that first, I don't want to work on the online editor, and I want with something which is local and where I get like, uh, nice tools. I would like to be able to do some things like testing that my code works locally before shipping it, and so this is where I'm going to go to part two. How do you get to something which is a bit sane? So uh, fortunately, again, the people in the Azure Functions team are not crazy, and they, they know that this is a problem. And so what they have been working on is something called the, uh, it was the Azure Functions CLI, Command Line Interactive, now known as the Core Tools. Uh, and so this is what I'm going to use next. The, it's installed via NPM. You run NPM, install something, 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 and it's, it's in your machine, and it's still in beta. So what I say might change in two weeks or three weeks, but it's going to be mostly correct. Uh, so, another point here is like, uh, why do I want to use the common line? I'm also going to use VS Code, uh, and I'm not going to use Visual Studio. So you might ask, is like, why is it that you don't want to use Visual Studio? Uh, there is tooling for Visual Studio. 
it is pretty nice. The reason I didn't want to use it is uh, Visual Studio, in my experience, does a lot of magic for you. And magic is great, uh, but uh, I tend to think of Visual Studio as Saruman. It's like it starts like a white wizard, it does a lot of good magic for you, and like when the wizard returns a bit dark, it's like suddenly you have orcs everywhere in your server and all of this. So it's like what I want is like I want to use code because in code there will be no magic involved. I will know exactly what happens. So we will leave Saruman aside, but if you like Visual Studio, this works very well there. It's just not what I want to do. So let's do that. And let's start working from the command line interactive. And so now I'm going to go to VS Code because this is what I said I would do. And I'm going to go to the terminal because like uh, real developers like, like the terminal. And I'm going to create a function. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, like, let's create something like NDC demo. Let's do CD NDC demo. And now is like uh, I can start using the command line. And so you have this instruction called func. And so I'm going, I have to show this because this is one of the touches which uh, is a detail but I really like is like you start with a magnificent ASCII art in color which is saying you, hey, function is there. And func gives you like a bunch of, a bunch of uh, commands which allow you to work with functions locally. So, uh, so first thing I'm going to do is like I want to create a function. So let's do that, func new. I'm going to call it, uh, I'm going to use F sharp as a language. I'm going to, I'm going to use as a trigger uh, HTTP, and I'm going to name it. Uh, I'm going to name it HTTP because why not? And so if I didn't mess up, is what I should see happen right now. Is I pop, 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 things happen. And if I look now at the folder I just created, which was NDC demo, I see that first I have a bit of a host stuff which happened, and here in the folder HTTP, this created for me like the exact scaffold I had. Uh, on the portal, except that it's local. So now it's like I can see that I have a function JSON. The function JSON file is telling me, hey, the trigger is going to be HTTP. All of this project JSON tells me, hey, this is taking a dependency on this library. And I have a run.fsx file, which is uh, giving you like a uh, scaffold for a basic HTTP trigger. And so what this does is like take the message, blah, 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 take it, look for something called name, and uh, return hello, the name. So nothing super exciting, but you can start from there. So what can I do with this? Well, I can do something like uh, uh, func. I can run it. And if I run it, I'm going to call HTTP. I'm going to pass it arguments. And the argument I'm going to pass it is going to be empty for now because I'm lazy. And so if I do this now locally, what will happen is that it will tell me, hey, if you want to run this locally, I need something like a server. So this is where you know it's not serverless. And now it's doing this. You can see it's starting to do a couple of things, like blah, blah, blah. And, uh, aha, and it didn't find the function HTTP. And that's because, that's because what, actually? This is odd. Let me try again. So this is unexpected because it looks like something is uh, finding something, but uh, huh. What did you say? Yeah, so I'm, I'm killing it right now, but like I'm not understanding why it's uh, because I do have a function. I, I distinctly have a function called HTTP. Um, see, this is a. I was happy everything worked uh, so far, but like I'm a bit surprised that this one is not working. So let's try again. HTTP. So this is the definition of insanity: is like doing twice or three times the same thing and hoping a different result. Uh, so this is working so far. It's not fun. Okay. So okay. So that's fine because uh, not. Uh, being a bit of a cautious person, like I trust technology, but not entirely. So what I did is like normally I have like uh, this thing already pre-written on the side. So I'm going to, to go to this other folder. So this one also has like the same type of setup and uh, run func run HTTP C. So this should also normally start the server. I want to start that server. So this is where you can see normally what is happening on the server, which is kind of useful. And normally what I should see is going to tell me like, hello. I'm having hope. Hope. Here we go. So uh, 
let's say like uh, you trust me because I'm a nice person, so I will ask you to ignore what happened. Like normally when I create this, I should have gotten that experience from the first one. I don't know what happened. If I fix it, we're going to waste some time. So let's ignore that part for, uh, let's, uh, let's say it didn't happen and this is what you should have seen. So what happened here is like I created a scaffold for an HTTP request. The HTTP request, uh, I'm trying to run my function locally. It creates a fake server, runs it, and like I can start to test locally my function. So now if I start to change the code here, like for instance, if I did something, so let's go back to uh, CLI. So now I'm in this guy, and if I go to the code here, and I do something, I do something like uh, instead of having say hello in lowercase, I'm going to do hello in uppercase and I save it. What I should be able to do is I should be able to, do, uh, to run this immediately and, uh, and it will do this job and I should be able to uh, iteratively see if yes or no, like my code is working. And so what I will see, is that now I'm, uh, I'm sensing like the, uh, the devil of the uh, failing demo is starting, okay, so this works. So. I was expecting now everything to crash because uh, that's usually how it goes. So it, uh, proving the point, I change the code, I just run it, and I see that my thing is working. So this is giving me a nice experience now. I'm on a VS code, I can iterate on my code, I can run everything locally, I don't need an internet connection, and uh, I'm, in a, I'm in a full development environment where I'm a happy camper. So this is why I like the command line interactive. Now, uh, so I'm going to go back for a second to the scaffold I created, and besides the fact that it didn't work, there is a bit of a problem here. So if I go back to NDC demo, and I go to this file here, I say that everything worked, and it's almost right. Uh, the thing which is good is that like, uh, it works because like, uh, I, get, uh, I can work in my environment and I can run my function. The thing which is not quite working is that uh, if I start going down a bit in my script, I'm going to see things like, hey, what is the trace writer? I don't know what the type is. Hey, what is the log? I don't know what it is. I don't know where this is coming from. And so like, on one side, is like I got code which is going to run the same way. So there is a bit of a paradox here because I got code which is the same as the code which would run if I push it to the uh, Azure portal. Uh, it's working because the command line interactive is completely able to run that code. So which is saying like uh, uh, one side tells me it's working. The other side is like VS code tells me it's not working. I don't know what all these things are. So that's weird, right? I have on one side, I have working code. On the other one, uh, the editor tells me I have broken code. And so this is where, uh, so uh, functions uh, are frameworky in that like when you give it the code, it's actually going to do also a lot of magic in the background, like it's going to load lots of dependencies for you. And so that's happening when you run it in the portal, that's happening when you run it in the command line. But now VS Code or Visual Studio doesn't know about any of these dependencies I'm taking because uh, this is just code, it doesn't know that it's a function. So how can I solve this? It's actually, uh, the good news is like if it's running locally, I know that these dependencies have to be somewhere on my machine, right? Otherwise it would not even run. So uh, I did a bit of a speleology or like a Sherlock, uh, Sherlock Holmes work. And if you do a bit of digging, you're going to find something like this. Uh, so here I'm in a user like me, Matthias. I go to app data. And if you go to roaming, you're going to see a folder called npm. So I mentioned at the beginning that locally it's installed via npm. So if I go to npm and I start digging, I'm going to see something called Azure Functions Command and all of this. So this is a, a good hint that this is probably where I want to look. And if I look at modules, I'm going to see Azure Function Core Tools. And if I keep digging further and further in the rabbit hole, I'm going to look at binaries, and here I will see all the magic dependencies that uh, the local thing is using. So the way I can solve this, if you want to write scripts in a way which is convenient locally, the, all, the only thing you need to do is like, tell VS Code, tell your environment that uh, for all the dependencies, you should look into this folder. That's not very hard. So this is what I did here. Uh, so this is on the, the other one. So this one is the one I run and this one is entirely unbroken, like this is done in a bit of a hacky or dirty way. But uh, the, uh, the way I went uh, about it was saying like, uh, that's simple. If you're running in the interactive mode, then I know I'm not running into, uh, I'm not running into uh, in, uh, the portal here, I'm interactive. If that is the case, you will look for all the dependencies in this folder. So that you could do this nicer, but essentially say like, uh, all the dependencies are here, load them up and you're going to be fine. Otherwise, you know you're running not interactive, so you're probably running it in the portal, and in that case, like, do it the way you would do it in the portal, and everything else is going to be exactly the same as before. 
So it's a bit uh, of a, it's not a particularly smart trick, but like this is, it took me a bit of time to find it. And so this is the way you can get full scripting experience with IntelliSense on your local machine and start working with this. And so now this is nice because I pretty much solved uh, most of the problems I have. Because at that point, what I can do is I don't need the portal to run things. I can start running things locally. Like I'm going to create quickly a fake logger. So here I'm, uh, uh, let me go to the output. Sorry, and I, what I want is like first I'm going to take all that script. I'm going to send it to the scripting environment. So this is done. And now I can say like uh, create a logger. That's fine. I'm going to create a fake request. And I'm going to say like uh, create that request, send a message, and send uh, and configure that request, create the log. And now I can, the function I have in my script run, I can now run entirely locally. I don't need any infrastructure. I can say, send the request with the log, grab, uh, grab the result, uh, wait for this, and show me what you got. And so let's do that. And this doesn't work because huh? I probably didn't run it right. So I'm going to do it a bit better. I'm simply going to uncomment all of this and run completely my script. I'm also going to flush my session, and I'm going to run this. So what I'm expecting here is like the run function is going to be called locally. It doesn't know anything about functions or anything. This is straight code, and I can run it. And uh, I can run it, but it fails. So uh, what is happening? So this is the moment where I would say it works on my machine, but obviously it doesn't work on my machine. What did I break? This is fine. The joy of a life code. Okay. Okay. So I'm not quite sure what I did wrong before. Uh, so all this for this. Uh, the, uh, but the, the result here is like uh, essentially I resolved like all the problems I was after because now I have code, I can work with it with IntelliSense with uh, all the classic methods I want for development and I can run my uh, function completely locally without any dependencies and so now I'm in a workflow which is actually acceptable, uh, I can uh, start to uh, write code and be happy again. Good. So this was a bit uh, rougher than what I expected but uh, apologies for that. Uh, so, so the recap here is like uh, the uh, uh, not all hope is lost. Is like you can actually, if you like scripts, if you want to stick to something which is close to the out of the box experience with uh, functions, you can do that. Uh, you can, uh, uh, you can. Uh, I like scripts because they're lightweight, they're flexible. I can still use that for development. And it's also what I did is extremely similar to the original. Uh, the only thing I did was uh, pointing to the right way, the right place for the dependencies. The drawbacks is like if interactive is a bit hacky, what this is really saying is like uh, I know that in the scripting environment I'm scripting, and I know that uh, outside of that environment it's compiled. So uh, it's not quite elegant. And the other thing which is not great is really like scripts are great up to a limit. Like it's difficult to write integration tests on scripts. It's difficult to uh, uh, it's difficult to share code. All of these things. So, but these are uh, normal problems with scripts. So the question here is like if you want to use scripts, this is a way to do it. But you might not want to use scripts because it will only bring you that far. So uh, can we do something different? And so the uh, or if scripts are the problem, maybe we can avoid scripts. And so the question is like, can we do this? And the answer is like yes, we can. And I, I had to uh, bring up that poster because uh, this is a memory of uh, better times, maybe. And so, so the, uh, the idea here is that like if you take a bit of a step back and uh, you, uh, you look at what the function does, like in the end, the function doesn't care at all about your code. All it is, uh, at the end, uh, it boils down to the bindings, and the bindings are saying, like, somewhere there is code. I will give it these arguments. I will run your code, and I will do something with it. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it could be a script. It could be uh, in whatever language you want. And so the idea of pre-compiled functions is like instead of running a script, you could actually call a DLL. So I'm going to show you like how this looks. Uh, let's do that first. I'm going to clean that up. I'm going to close all of this. So this is where I'm going to not save this. And I'm going to show you uh, something which is a bit uh, bigger. So if I go to the pre-compiled folder. The first thing I did here, so I created two folders. It's a bit, uh, uh, so, so the one thing I did here is that I created an old school uh, library project. 
And so that library project is using standard things, like it's using packet to manage dependencies, and I have an FS file, which means that it's a compiled F sharp script, or compiled, sorry, uh, equivalent to a CS file. Like this is regular code. I have, uh, only thing I did was I created a namespace, and here I created a module, and otherwise, like everything else is the code I had before, like name, run, blah, blah, blah. So no change in the code. All I did was take the script and transform it into a class. And so now what I would uh, like to do is I would like to say, I can build that thing, I will get a DLL with all the dependencies in a folder. And uh, if I do this, is like what I would like is I would like the function to say, instead of calling run on an FSX file, I would like to say, look at that DLL, which is going to be located in a specific place, and call that particular method on it. And uh, as it turns out, so this is not very difficult. So now on the function side, what I would have on the portal is something which looks like this. I have my HTTP function like before. Uh, and now you might notice something, which is I, this is really stripped down to the barest possible uh, function you could think of. Is like what I have is like I don't have an FSX file, I don't have anything. I just have bindings, and I have like project JSON for the dependencies. I could actually nuke it as well, but and the bindings are simply doing this. I'm saying like uh, the code you're going to run is not a script. It's not this. It's not that. It is a DLL. That DLL you will find in this folder. So in that case, I put it somewhere, it's ugly, but like that should be a folder on your function. So you will find something called precompile.dll, and the entry point is going to be something which is core, that's a namespace, foo is my uh, class or my module, and run is the function in question. So now is that like if I'm lucky, uh, I will prove even that it works. So let's go to cd, uh, cd precompiled cd function, and now I should be able to do func run, and I call this again HTTP. I'm again going to pass it uh, like uh, my arguments, and I should probably have done something else. So, so see, and if this works out, is like uh, what this should show you is like uh, what I did here is like I completely removed the dependency on the scripts. I'm back in territory of all DLLs, uh, and. Uh, and uh, I think it worked. Yes, something came back to me. So now it's like what I did is like I called the code which I have in my DLL. So this is good news. On the F sharp side, I can do that. You can also totally do that on the C sharp side. Like uh, just do your good old project, uh, compile your DLL, and then like move it to the function, and you're done. This is also good news because if you have this, this is a regular project, so I can build it. I can add unit tests. I can add integration tests. Like all the tooling you're used to works. And this is, uh, to the latest uh, I heard, like this is kind of the direction the functions team is advocating for uh, development down the line, is like you should probably have a project with all your code and just like send the DLLs and use pre-compiled functions for this. Good. So let me go back here. So the benefits here. <laughs> The benefits here are you're back in a familiar territory for tooling. You know, like, uh, if this is a standard uh, C sharp project, F sharp project, you know what to do. You have full control on the dependencies because now it's like uh, you're not dependent, dependent on a project JSON. You can actually explicitly say, I want this DLL, that DLL, so you're completely in control. You, there are also some performance benefits. If it's pre-compiled, it's going to run a tiny bit better than if you work uh, from the scripts. The drawbacks is like the setup is a bit more painful. Like I lost the beauty of scripts where I can just hack, write a script, and ship it. And uh, the deployment is slightly more complicated because now I need to compile, I need to move it to the right folder in the function, I need to deploy that. So uh, you lose the lightness of the scripts, but you gain a lot of uh, on the tooling side. So pick your poison or choose like uh, if you're more of a hacker or more of an enterprise developer, like uh, you can pick which direction you want to go. So, uh, so these are like the two ways you can go from a, a not very good, uh, from a, say an okay-ish uh, development experience on the portal to something which is going to work locally with a decent method. So now I want to touch on a different question. Uh, so part of the reason I moved into uh, these questions was because I started writing functions and I mentioned in the beginning that I was doing a bot. So the bot in question is not usually important, but it's a bot which takes input on Twitter. And if you send it a tweet, it's going to uh, take this as f -sharp code. It's going to run it to the compiler, and it's going to send you back a tweet with the result of the evaluation. So uh, entirely pointless, very fun project. And this was, uh, this was great. So, uh, so this is how I started uh, diving into functions. The reason this worked really well is like I mentioned the fact that this was cheaper than what I had before. The second reason is like it was a, a perfect mapping for functions. It's like uh, I'm doing three things. I have one function which is checking mentions. That's a timer which is going to look every two minutes, check on Twitter if somebody talked about me. If I have something, take this, send it to a queue, and process this using the compiler. That's a second function. 
And then from that function, if it succeeded, didn't succeed, compose a message and send back a tweet to the person who called you in the first place. So that was my bot. And uh, I wrote this that way, and this was fine. The, the thing is, uh, uh, it started small, uh, and then it's like I started using other functionality. Like one of the functionalities I added was if you send me a tweet, uh, because I'm a marketing, uh, uh, because that bot is a marketing genius, it wants to follow you so that you're happy, and so that like, it creates the uh, impression that this is an important bot. And so I start to add one function, two functions, three functions, ten functions. It's like if you don't pay attention very quickly, you have like maybe 20 functions. And so at that point, like, things start to be a bit complicated because, uh, so let's see what happens. Like, on one side, uh, the thing which is nice is like every function is entirely self-described. It, it, is, it, it is in its own folder, uh, and so that's cool. Uh, the problem is uh, you have a bit of a stringly typed problem here, which is, uh, which is the problem I hit in the beginning with the queue. It's like uh, all I'm saying is I'm saying I have a queue called foo, a queue called bar, and if I do a typo, it's like I might have something which compiles, every function is working, but none of the things are working together. And so how do you keep track of this? And uh, if you start to have something bigger, it's like is it possible to uh, get an overview of what this whole application is doing together? And so this is where the point of uh, declarative infrastructure is coming in. Is like the good news is like every function is uh, isolated, but it entirely it entirely defines what it is expected to run against. Like if I look at the function JSON at the function JSON here, I'm seeing I don't even know what the code is. In the end, I don't really care. But if I look at that, I see that uh, this thing is going to be called by a queue, and that queue should be called friends. And so if I look at 20 functions and I see this one, it's like uh, I'd better have somewhere a function which is calling a queue called uh, friends and sending a message to it. Otherwise, I know things are disconnected, right? It's like, why would I have a queue and nobody talking to that queue? And so the idea I followed was, uh, uh, forget for a minute about the, uh, the code, if I have many functions uh, each of them in the folder, it's very easy to pause this, scan this, and start to produce a graph of what the function is doing, which I think is one of the interesting aspects of functions. Uh, like the whole environment or the whole architecture is very explicit and it's entirely defined with the code itself. And so I'm going to show you like what I built with this. I wanted to uh, make it into a function, but I didn't have time to do it yet. Like I wanted to do a function to graph functions. But uh, the, uh, so I'm going to demo this right now. So this is uh, pulled from uh, GitHub, like the FSI bot code. So what I have is I have four functions, check mentions, and check mentions has a function JSON. And you can see that, uh, for instance, this guy is, uh, is uh, using a timer. It's using a blob. It's actually writing to a blob. It's reading to a blob. It's talking to a queue. It's talking to another queue. So I have this for this function. I have this across like four different functions. And what I would want is that, can you tell me something interesting about the application altogether? And so, uh, I'm not going to dive exactly in the code I wrote, but uh, the code here is like I wrote a script which is passing all these files, and so if I run it, uh, if I run that code, let's do that. So all I will do here is like use uh, use a script, look at the directory where I have FSI bot, where I just cloned my application. And then it's like uh, pass this and create uh, a document which is going to represent the function. And so if I do that, this should be now, uh, I should have now FSA bot graph somewhere here. And this is not working right because I'm not in the right folder. Sorry about that. So let me run this again. And now I what I should see pop is I should see uh, it created for me a graph file, so that file is completely ugly, but the reason, like, uh, uh, let me explain a bit what this does. This file is looking at, I spotted like four different functions. I have nodes, so I'm grabbing out of these files like, all the triggers, all the nodes, all the dependencies, and putting them into a file which is saying this goes to this, this goes to this. And the reason I care about it is because now I can use a tool like GraphViz, uh, which is like a, a graph visualization tool, and I can run something like that. I can say, take now the file you just generated by looking at the code of the application. And I can go here and I can say, run this. And so it's going to do something. And now what you see is like it took this and it created a PNG file. And that PNG file, so I'm going to zoom in in a second. But like what I created here is like a diagram for my whole application. And think about this, like this is awesome. I get an application, I just run a couple lines of code and I can see exactly what it does and how it does it. Here I have a timer, so let me zoom in. What this is telling me is like this application has a timer. That timer is going to call something called check mentions. Check mentions is going to uh, take a dependency and link to Twitter. 
uh, and it's going to do four things. It's going to read and write to a blob, and it's going to send a message to that queue and a message to that queue. That queue is actually going to trigger another function, which is going to be follow the user, and this is done. So it's a simple tool. And what this gives you is like a, a very quick di diagnosis on like, uh, is my application broken? Like if I had a, a mistyped queue somewhere, I would see a queue and it goes nowhere. So I get a full visualization of the application in one place. So, uh, so I like that. Good, so uh, yeah, I demoed this. So as a conclusion, is like, uh, first, uh, there are a couple of topics I didn't touch, touch on. One of them was integration test. Uh, I couldn't quite get it to run yet. Part of it is because the command line tools, uh, so it should be working in the latest version of the command line tools, but if you're in a place where you can trigger everything from command line, it should not be difficult to uh, run like all the functions together in an integration test. So uh, I, I didn't talk about this for that reason. One question which is on my mind is like, uh, now I have function, an individual function, I have function app, and I have potentially many function apps together. I don't know quite yet what's the right division between these, so that's something I'm looking at now. I don't have good advice on this. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm going to pass on that. So current verdict and functions from, uh, from my side. What I hope I managed to convey in this talk is that one is that uh, functions are extremely helpful in many scenarios which are typical small script scenarios. Things like I have a batch job I'm running once a week, if it's not too CPU intensive, if it's not too big, it's like you should really look at functions because it's going to be dirt cheap, super easy to deploy, and it just works. So that's great. So it's awesome for all the small scenarios. The piece where I still have doubts is like at what point is it too big for its own good? So I'm currently at things with maybe 10 functions. I know a person who wrote something with over 100 functions. I'm not sure if I would advise that. Like this is a place where I'm still wondering about. Workflow and patterns, I showed you like the best I got so far. Um, uh, one of the things which is fun is that functions make lots of things very easy, but suddenly things which were very easy before are completely open for discussion. Like, uh, uh, in a way, like I spent like one hour telling you this is bad because I cannot write tests. Uh, normally, that's a problem which has been solved like 20 years ago. So these type of small problems pop back up, and it's kind of interesting to see what workflow and patterns emerge. So I try to share what I found so far. I found this like amazingly fun to code with. So this is completely not technical, it's purely qualitative, but uh, I encourage you to look at it because it's, uh, there is something nice about hacking a bit of code, running it, seeing what happens. Like it brings back, uh, it makes like, uh, maybe it makes coding uh, uh, great again. Uh, and uh, so advice is like, I don't know how much you, can, you should use it, but I really, really advise you to take a look. And it works particularly beautifully with F-sharp. And uh, so this is what I had. So big thanks. Uh, this is where you can find me. Like most of the code I showed is on GitHub. What is not there yet will be there soon. And this is what I had. So thank you.